Hi, I'm Barbara Fox, and this week I thought I'd do a talk about PTP, the Precision Time Protocol. This is defined by the IEEE in Report 1588, Version 2. Now, V2 is not backward compatible with V1. So PTP synchronizes the clocks in a packet network. And it's important to have the clock synchronized for the different applications that run on the network. In cellular networks, you have to pass traffic between towers. In factories, you need all the devices to have precise clocks in order to create the products that you're creating. In financial networks, you need precise time to determine the timing of financial transactions. So why is it necessary to be able to synchronize clocks in an asynchronous packet network. So we used to be able to pull timing into the COs, just into the COs, the central offices. But in those cases, we could maintain a separate synchronous timing network and just pull it through. With cell networks, we need to be able to bring timing to the towers. And it doesn't make sense to run a separate synchronous timing network that gets pulled out to the towers. And so timing has to be maintained in an asynchronous packet network. So how does that work? So in this case, for clocks, we've got a master clock and a slave clock. So the master has the time that we want all of the devices in the network to maintain. So in this case, I've made it so that the master has a time of 100 and the slave has a time of 75. Now, I'm not giving units here because the precision of the timing is gonna dep depend on the application, on the devices and the hardware that's in the network. And some applications require more precision than others. And so I'm just gonna leave the units off. Now, in this case, the master I've got two timelines indicating the master. Part is the CPU and part is the output queue. Now we've talked about forwarding traffic, traffic out queues in the traffic management videos. So uh, we understand that the time that it takes a, a packet to exit a device is dependent on the scheduling algorithms, the amount of traffic that's coming through. So there can be a delay within the system itself, within the master, from when the packet is actually generated by the CPU to when it's actually forwarded out into the network through a, an output queue. So in this case, for this protocol, the CPU generates a, a synchronous packet and it says that the time that it was generated is 100. It's forwarded out into the network and the time that it's forwarded, it's saved by the master. So it actually exited the device at time 101. It's received by the slave at time equals 78. And so the, sa the slave saves that time away, the 78. Now the master sends a follow-up packet saying, oh, that packet, I actually forwarded that packet at time equals 101. And it forwards that into the network. And so what the slave does is it says, oh, okay, it was forwarded from you at 101. I received it at 78. So the time difference is 23. So that includes you know, the difference in the network. And so what the, the slave does is it says, oh, my next time would have been 83, but I'm, I'm gonna add the 23 to it. And now my time is 106. But if you look at 106 versus 108, they're still out of sync. And the reason that they're out of sync is that we didn't take into consideration the latency of the network itself. How much time passed while the packet was being forwarded from the one device to the other device. And so the slave wants to figure this out. So what it does is it makes a delay request to the master and it says, oh, that delay request exited my system at time equals 108 and it saves that time. And what the master does is it says, okay, I received the request at time equals 112 and it forwarded, forwards a delay response with the 112 to the slave. And the slave says, oh, okay. So I sent you the packet at 108 and you received it at 112. So that is going to be the network latency. 
but it's actually the network latency divided by two. So what we're assuming is that the latency is the same in both directions, you know, from, from the slave to the master and the master to the slave. But it says, okay, because I sent it at 108, I hadn't taken into consideration the latency for the time I received, but that is taken into consideration when I send you the delay request. So I take the time that you received a delay request minus the time I sent it divided by two and that's the network latency. And so what it says here is, oh, my next time would be 116. I'm going to add in the network latency, make it 118. And now the two clocks are in sync. So as you can see, you know, if there's just two clocks, it's still a good amount of messages that have to happen. And because clocks can skew over time, the protocol is running continuously. Like we're trying to keep the clocks in sync all the time because of the precision necessary uh, in the network. And so if you only had one master clock and you know thousands of slave clocks, the master really wouldn't be able to service all of these clocks. And so what we do is we determine what the network looks like with this master slave protocol running in the network. Now in networking, we never want loops. And so we're gonna have one grand master, and in this case, it's this clock here, that is actually keeping the time and that time is getting propagated out to the entire network. And so we want all of the devices in the network to have the same type time as this grandmaster clock. And so what we do is this clock becomes the head of the tree. And then we're going to forward the traffic from there. So while this is a mesh network with a lot of connections, we're really going to forward the traffic through the tree itself. So how do we determine how what the tree looks like? Well, when two devices share a link and they're running the PTP protocol, what they do is they say, okay, who's got the better clock? And in this case, this grandmaster will have the better clock. And so these two devices will negotiate and they will determine that this device is the master and this device is the slave. And so this device will get its time from this grandmaster clock, just in the way that we talked about on the previous slide. Now, this device is the slave to this, to the grandmaster, but it can be master to many slaves, to one or more slaves. And in this case, it's going to run its protocol with both of these devices to which it's directly connected and determine that it has the best clock. Now, even if their clocks are the same, uh, the fact that this clock is closer to the grandmaster gives it a better clock. There's going to be negotiations through the network about who's got uh, the best timing. And so we're gonna create a tree. Now, what happens in a case like this where, okay, this guy has gotten, it's gotten its timing from the master and it's sharing its timing to its slave. This guy is getting his, its timing from the master and sharing the timing to its slave. Now, what happens with this port here? Well, the truth is both of these guys have the same clock and they both also have a master. So one of them will say, this is a passive port. You already have, you have time. You don't need to be my, you don't need to be my slave because you're getting better time from this guy than I would be able to give you because this, this guy is closer to the grandmaster. And so these ports will be declared passive and these ports will be pruned from the tree. So we have ordinary clocks and ordinary clocks are basically clocks with only one port. And they can be either a master as in this case or a slave as in these cases. And so they're gonna, they're an ordinary clock. A border, a boundary clock is a clock that can act as both a master and a slave. So it'll have one slave port and then it can have one or more master ports. So, it's a pretty cool protocol. It's pretty cool, you know, how you're able to pull precise timing throughout the network. Uh, and they're really taking into consideration latency and stuff. So uh, I thought it was an interesting thing to understand. So thanks for your attention. Take care.